My name's JC McCauley. I'm Naisha McCauley, and, and you're, you're watching, watching AccessTV.org. Good evening, everyone. You all sound like you all work 40 hours today in one day. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. There we go. Can we put our hands together and just wake ourselves up, please? At this moment, we are going to be led in prayer by the wonderful shepherd of this church, my good friend, Pastor Trevor Buford. Can we put our hands together for Pastor Buford as he comes? Let me first say what an honor and privilege it is to have you here um, and to stand with you in this work that is simply about right and wrong. And we are grateful um, to welcome you to Union Baptist Church and grateful to begin tonight um, with a word of prayer. But as we prepare our hearts for that moment, we find it appropriate to take a moment of silence, not only to remember in our hearts the violence that many of us were in shock that happened in Sandy Hook, not too far from here, but also a moment to remember um, urban violence around the country. Um, it doesn't just happen in Sandy Hook, it happens That's on right. streets everywhere. That's right. And we should remember all those um, who've been victims to that. So in your own way, take a moment to be reflective and remember. Let us pray. Gracious God, we are gathered tonight with people as a community to stand tall and do what you call to do for each of us. Lord, we know there is a right and there is a wrong. And tonight, Lord, we stand for truth and justice as only you can command us to. Lord, I want to pray especially for these, my brothers and sisters of this community who are choosing to risk themselves right. and stand for their neighbors and call out wickedness in high places. So God, give them a special strength tonight to know that they don't stand alone, that they stand in the anointing and power that you give on the shoulders of those who've gone before them and with an entire community standing behind them, pushing them forward. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Once again, welcome, and we're so glad you're here. Can we please put our hands together, Pastor Trevor Buford. <laughs> Those that are standing in the back, there are still seats here. Uh, we don't want to uh, block the exit. Or if you're going to stand, try not to stand at the door um, as we go forward tonight. Just for a moment, I would like to uh, just go over our agenda for the evening. And then I'm going to accept the motion and then we're going to go into a vote. God bless you, Brother Fred. Tonight we are going to welcome. We're going to have our welcome and our framing. We are going to look at the problem at hand. We're going to look at the background, the wins to date, the ongoing issues, the tenant testimonies, questions for Mayor Bronin. Uh, we're then going to have Mayor Bronin's response, and then we are going to wrap up. Is there a motion on the floor that we accept this agenda tonight? Is there a second? All in favor of this agenda tonight, will you please reply, reply by saying aye. All opposed? Well, thank you very much. Put your hands together. We're already getting business done tonight. Right now, I would like to invite up one of the bravest tenant leaders that have uh, been working in this uh, consistent fight. Uh, I would like to bring up Mr. Joshua Serrano. Can we please encourage him by putting your hands together? And this is church. You can talk back a little bit. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. First off, I just want to start by saying thank you, Pastor. Lovely, kind words. We all need that. Also, I'd like to welcome everyone here tonight. 
and thank you all for coming. My name is Joshua Serrano. I reside at 1545 Main Street, apartment C3. I've been living here for the last 11 years. The last three years, I've been head of household. We have been organizing for better living conditions for the past seven months and have become convinced that the owner, Mr. Ku, does not have our best interests at heart. Up until two days ago, we had a different welcome for you guys in mind. Mm. But now in the last two days, That's we've right. been under attack. That's right. In the last two days, our owner, Emmanuel Ku, has started to intimidate tenants by spreading false and misleading inf information about the CAC and us tenant leaders and what we are trying to do. Mr. Ku has been calling tenants to his office under false conditions, for instance, saying he needs to talk to them about the utility allowance or something like that. When tenants arrive at the office, they have been met by Mr. Ku's lawyer and or Mr. Ku himself. They have been told that the CAC is trying to take away our housing subsidy and trying to make us homeless, believe it or not, outrageous. Mm -hmm. He's telling them not to work with the CAC. And if they want to keep their subsidy and then pursuing them to sign a, a petition asking CAC to cease and to cease. He also sent a legal notice to the CAC not to enter any care apartments or buildings or they would be arrested. Wow. Can't believe that. Like, if I bring them personally, how can they not come in with me? Tenants have a legal right to organize and a legal right to seek the assistance of outside help, such as the CAC. So these actions that Mr. Ku has taken appear to be a violation of fair housing laws, and we intend to pursue that. That's right. I want to start the night off by saying that the CAC has had our back from day one and always follow the tenant's lead. So in other words, they don't make a move without us, without us saying. That's right. That's right. Mr. Su Mr. Cool is saying that a small group of tenants are making these decisions for all the tenants, and that is incorrect. It is true that we have a small leadership group, but that's because we meet multiple times a week for long periods of time to do the research that many others don't have the time to do. But before we make any decision, and I mean any decision, we engage in extensive door knocking campaigns. I'm pretty sure a lot of you either seen this personally mm -hmm. or had seen notes or flyers stuck on your door. That's all in efforts to get some feedback and to get you in communication with us. We all, we will talk tonight about our desire to have Cool lose his subsidy because we believe our future under cool will be one of slumlord conditions. Mm -hmm. But let me say right here, if cool were to lose his subsidy, tenants would all be given protection vouchers by HUD and allowed to move anywhere in the U.S. immediately. That's right. And at this time, I would like to hand it over to our organizer, Pastor AJ and Corey, to provide an overview of Mr. Ku's history as a slumlord. Thank you very much. When I say no more, you say slumlords. No more. Slumlord. No more. Slumlord. No more. Slumlord. Thank you all so much tonight. Uh, we just want to say thank you, Josh, for your leadership. Thank you to the tenant leaders that are here tonight. The law provides tenants protections against retaliation. To all the tenants in the room, if you feel you are experiencing retaliation for requesting repairs, for partic participating in these efforts, and are facing eviction or threat or uh, eviction, lawyers from the Greater Hartford Legal Aid are here and are willing to help. Will you raise your hand, the lawyers from Legal Aid? Mr. Cecil Thompson, yes, thank you. Can we put our hands together for Legal Aid? Yes, That's here today. That's been fighting the good fight in the city for a long time. If you need their assistance, if you need their assistance, please call Greater Hartford Legal Aid at 860-541-5000. 860-541-5000. Thank you very much. I'm going to invite Corey. I'm going to invite, I'm sorry, uh, a resident who has lived in these apartments for about 18 years to come, 20, 28 years to come give her testimony 
can we greet her with, put your hands together, make some noise, and support my dear friend, Ms. Hilma Jones, as she comes. As she makes her way, the picture right here is in her son's bedroom. That's a hole in the floor that looks down to the basement. Hello, my name is Hilma Jones. I reside at 49 Belton Street, Apartment 81. I have lived here for 28 years. I've had the worst experience living in care apartments. I've had several accidents in my home due to the lack of maintenance. Two days ago, I was greeted at my door after work and maintenance hours with a document that I could, hard, I could barely read and felt forced to sign. So Lee Ortiz, the property manager, said that if I didn't sign it, then I would lose my subsidized housing okay. and I would be stuck paying the contract rent of $1,132. I currently pay $814 and I have no Section 8. My apartment isn't worth that much. I signed the document because I felt intimidated and I was not told the truth. I don't understand how this is possible when three dead mice were removed from the basement because of the awful smell that I have called the office since Monday. Mm -hmm. And then solely came out with Tony. I am in favor of removing the subsidy so I can get the mobile voucher and have a better quality of life. I've dealt with a lot and I'm still dealing with a lot. And my apartment still smells like dead mice because I'm on the first floor, okay? So I'm very upset. And to be a tenant for so long, I should own the building, but I don't. They just care about the money they can get from us. They've changed staff. They've changed management. As soon as you get used to somebody, they're gone. I'm sick of it.
AccessTV.org. This is Big Papa Flavor checking you guys out all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Give her one more hand, please. Let's get started. CAC got involved with care attendance about seven months ago when staff at Thurman Milner School called with concerns about mice bites on a student's arm. Can somebody say, my God? my God? I checked out the situation and found the mom at the hospital with her young daughter who had ingested uh, rat poison and was getting her stomach pumped. From there we met with the neighbors and realized the entire building was infested with mice. Tenants were catching up to 15 to 20 mice a night on sticky traps. That led us to the realization that the owner was Mr. Koo, a national slumlord who, granted, who was granted a HUD contract in a city tax abatement on 26 buildings, 150 apartments in, Har in Hartford, after HUD and the city had been warned about his reputation in the Hartford Business Journal in August 2007, four years before the sale was finalized. The title of the Hartford Business Journal article was Alleged Slumlord Targets Hartford. So how did Mr. Ku gain his national slumlord reputation? Ku owned 13 buildings with 223 apartments in New York City in 2005. During Ku's ownership, New York City cited him for 2,953 code violations, a rate 10 times higher than under previous owners of those buildings. He took an average of 992 days to correct violations, and Ku was voted the third worst slumlord in New York City. The third. the third. It takes a lot to be the third worst something in New York City. I'll just point that out. In 2004, Congress approved Section 219 of uh, the National Housing Act, which is nicknamed the Coup Law, among advocates. Section 219 was supposed to prevent landlords uh, without outstanding housing code violations from purchasing properties from HUD. The law has not been effective because KU continues to be granted contracts in other states like Connecticut. For example, uh, despite thousands of open code violations and pending lawsuits, HUD granted KU a contract in Birmingham, Alabama in 2005. Over 140 tenants are suing KU right now for, among other things, barring them from accessing their belongings for over a year after a fire. Since Ku's purchase of the Trade Towers, they have had three fires, over 20 suspicious deaths, or deaths that were not discovered for a number of days, widespread complaints of deteriorating conditions following Ku's, condition, Ku's purchase. A quick Google search of Emmanuel Ku in Alabama surfaces articles with these headlines. Four months after fire, Trade Towers residents still barred from apartments. Death in Trade Towers, where the elderly poor come to live and die. The coroner's office investigated more unattended or suspicious deaths at Coos Trade Towers than any other apartment complex in Jefferson County, all because he failed to hire a reputable management company. Coos strikes again. He was granted a HUD contract in Hartford in 2009. 26 buildings. 150 units in the Northern neighborhood, 2.6 million federal subsidy per year, and almost a $266,000 city tax abatement. The tenants, in addition to being upset with their own living conditions, are angry that Ku was granted this contract when his reputation as a national slumlord is so well documented. Ku's Hartford contract includes 26 buildings, 150 units, in one North End neighborhood. In one North End neighborhood. He received $2.6 million a year from the federal government and a city tax abatement of $266,000 a year. To address this, the tenants have contacted Congressman Larson to investigate 
how this happened. The congressman wanted to be here tonight, but had to be in D.C., so we sent this statement. We want to be clear that the local HUD office did not want the contract granted to coup. It was the federal office in Texas that granted him the contract. It's going to be loud for a second. Good evening. I'm sorry I can't be in attendance tonight, but I wanted to give you all an update on some of the work my office has done to help the 150 people living in 26 units in the Clay Arsenal neighborhood. I've written to the Secretary of the Department of Housing and Urban Development, Dr. Ben Carson, and saw him just this week to ask how a landlord with a nationwide reputation be allowed or found eligible to purchase and manage another HUD property when he had a nationwide reputation of negligence. It is imperative that we keep the owner of these units, Emmanuel Q's feet in the fire to ensure the residents have a clean, safe housing that they richly deserve. I want you all to know I am committed in assisting you to continue to work with the property owner to keep these units available, maintained and affordable to the citizens of Connecticut. We will share the response from Dr. Carson as soon as we receive it. I urge you to report any need for maintenance or follow-up to the local HUD office director, Suzanne Piacenti, at 860-240-9702. And please also continue to stay in touch with our office as well at 860-278-8888. Thank you so much, and know that I have your back on this. As we mentioned earlier, we started working with tenants at their request seven months ago. Progress has definitely been made thanks to the tireless organizing work being done by the tenant leaders. Some of their wins include... Our wins to date include... I want you all to celebrate this because these tenants have been working hard tirelessly without getting paid. They are out there in their community doing what is best for them and their fellow tenants. Tenants won a 50-unit REAC inspection from HUD. Can we put our hands together for that, please? 2,300 violations, uh, repairs were identified. Ku was issued a formal notice of corrective action from HUD and placed in a special HUD division for intensive monitoring. The city of Hartford has committed, has committed to rewriting the city's housing code uh, to better respond to issues like this. Can we celebrate the work that these brave tenants have been doing? There are ongoing issues. One of the issues is that Ku continues to pass federal inspections. These are the inspections performed on all HUD properties throughout the United States to make sure they are maintaining decent, safe, and sanitary conditions. Ku's properties are anything but decent, safe, and sanitary. So how does he pass? The evaluation process is really complex, but we want to highlight two components of the inspection process that allow slumlords to pass. The first has to do with point deductions. If you own one building and you have a misaligned chimney, you can receive a 15.5 point deduction. If you own 20 buildings and have a misaligned chimney, you lose 0.78 points. <coughs> so the more properties you own right. decreases the number of points you're deducted for each violation. Right? The next part will bring it together. The other issue is what's called a zero constraint rule. If in a dwelling unit you lose the maximum amount of points that you can lose, and there are still more violations, your score stops at zero. It doesn't go into the negatives. So many, many violations go unrecorded because of the zero constraint rule. It's meant to protect good landlords who maybe there's one unit that is really atrocious to prevent them from becoming in default because of one tenant. But there isn't a threshold within this that signals, OK, there's 74 inoperable smoke alarms. Something ought to be weighted differently when you get to that level. Wow. And that's how he continues to pass. Many people have asked the tenants, why don't you just pick up and move? They can't. These are project-based units, which means the subsidy is with the unit, not the tenant. 
If they choose to move, they no longer have a subsidy. The tenant leaders, after an extensive process with HUD and the city, after experiencing their fifth or sixth management company in as many years, after a failed management review, which confirmed that KU does not have a functioning business office, tenant le the tenant leaders realize that Mr. KU does not have any intention or proven track record in improving the quality of his apartment. He is doing the base level repairs to satisfy HUD, but we will demonstrate why this simply an effort to get HUD off his back and is not a long-term improvement. Tenants are experiencing a flurry of activity, such as the installation of new counters, of course some fresh paint, and maybe some used appliances. Here is a video that shows how improvements are being performed. So, at least my assessment, I'm not a professional, I'm oh, James Sanchez, councilman, city of Hartford, uh, from experience when my father used to own 12 buildings, we had to renovate and fix all piping, plumbing, tiles, and all that. Um, unfortunately, uh, this kitchen area is in uh, dire straits, it needs uh, a full renovation. Uh, you have openings down here with rodents, and roaches can come in through there, roaches can come through any cracks. Right here you have openings. Um, once the cabinet is, on, is installed, uh, the rodents are still going to continue to chew their way in and cause damage and uh, you know, it's, a health, it's a health hazard also. You got these openings down here. Um, the tiles need to be replaced. This floor is spongy, indication that it's rotted. So eventually the structure under here could be uh, compromised as well. So And the worker did confirm that he's installing cabinets today, so it's not so work that's yet to be done. My suggestion is that the uh, cabinets not be installed until HUD comes here and do a true inspection. They were installed. <laughs> HUD, comes through and do a true no. No, HUD did not come through and do a full inspection. And they still installed it. And they still installed it. As a result, the tenant leaders polled CARA tenants and came to the overwhelming conclusion that giving the choice of living under coup for a lifetime or having a mobile voucher so they can move, they decided they want to move. If coup subsidy is pulled by HUD for non-compliance, the tenants will receive a tenant protection voucher and have the freedom to move anywhere they want. They will no longer be bound by Ku's apartments. They will not have to wait on the 5,000 people waiting list. Now we'd like to hear directly from the tenants on what they've experienced since the first public action this past summer. The first person we'd like to introduce is Ms. Julissa Espinal. Can we put our hands together for her please as she comes? She is a brand new mother, by the way. You can't even tell. You can't even tell. <laughs> My name is Julissa Spinan, and I reside at 5 Florence Street. I gave birth to my baby girl in September, and when it came time for me to go home, the social worker at San Francis Hospital said she could not release the baby to the apartment because of the mice infestation. I fear, I fear I would be separated from my baby, but she made me clear that the concern was not about me as a mother, but about the condition caused by the lander. CAC help forced Mr. Ku to put me and my family in a hotel so that I could stay with my baby. Thanks. I left the hospital and went directly to a hotel. When we were there for seven days while maintenance worked on my apartment, I returned to a bathroom where they spray painting to the top, the top, a broken bed, new counters without handles, and a sink not connected to the counters. 
I also returned to a large rat trap to a stick pad in my kitchen and fresh mouse poop in the cupboards. I was devastated and just wanted out but had no choice to stay. Then on November 30, a letter was slipped under my door informing me that I had 10 days to pay 1,600 and back rent or the owner will be taken possession of my unit. The day they slipped the letter in, under my door was the, the thing they based on the day on the letter. I called, the, I called the office and immediately, immediately, and nobody was there to answer me. I was fearful all night that the next morning we will be evicted. We met, the C, we met with CAC and HUD, and HUD forced the owner to correct the notice and issues and apologize. But only after days of wondering if today was the day I was getting evicted with my four children. It turns out many residents received this letter in error. And who knows if some residents pay uh, what they were told to pay out of fear even if they did not actually owe the money. This is one example of how incompetent and corrupt the rental office is. I want the best for my children, and it is it's hard to provide them with hope and security living under those conditions, and, and despite Mr. Good intimidation, I plan to fight until this is right. Thank you. Now we'll have uh, a wonderful student, her daughter, uh, come and speak. Can we please encourage this young lady as she comes? Hi, my name is Alicia. I'm a freshman, and I live in one of the apartments with my mom and three siblings. We have been dealing with this terrible living conditions for a long time, but I'm proud to say that my mother has been fighting to change things. I made, it made me want to fight too. School is very important to us and to my mom, but sometimes it's hard to concentrate because we are afraid to sleep at night. We can hear the mice in the walls and never know when one is coming into our room. I worry about my little brother and baby sister. I spoke to the city, I spoke to the city council. I spoke, I, spoke at the city council meeting for the first time last week ad advocating for changes. It felt good to speak out. Kids should not have to live this way. And I want to ask the mayor tonight to, to do something about this. I might, have to graduate, I might have to graduate high school in these conditions, but I do not want this for my baby brother and newborn sister. We need to fight for them, and I hope you will help us. I wish I could give you a job right now, bro. We, we, we need you. We need you. Harvard needs you. Now we'll have uh, comments from uh, Joshua uh, Serrano. Can we please put our hands together as he comes this evening? So as I stated earlier, my name is Joshua Serrano, and I reside at 5045, and I've been here for 11 years. Again, for the last three years, I've been head of household. Under Coos ownership, conditions in the building have only gotten a lot worse. Since we had our first public meeting this summer, repairs have been made. I'm not going to lie. But they're a joke. Craftsmanship to you name it. 
They fixed the mold in my bathtub by simply spraying the tub with spray paint. And I don't know if you guys are aware, when we started this, uh, we showed some, some mold infested tubs and I so happened to live in one of those apartments and that's how they quote unquote fixed the issue. So for the naked eye, you can't see it, but to me, my son, we know what really happened and it's kind of disgusting. With that being said, when I clean the tub, not only do paint chip off, but the paint has now discolored. Unbelievable. They install new shower nubs as well in the process, but they did not properly install the screws. The knobs come off every time I turn the water on or off. And as a, as a parent, I'm afraid that one of the knobs will come off while my son is using the, using the tub, and I'm afraid he might get burned. Up to date, I am still dealing with mice infestation, regardless the efforts he say he's been putting forward. I want to admit, I found my voice and a new family in the, organi in the organizing process, and I'm proud of that. And I'm here to say, in front of everybody here, in front of these cameras, that I'm here to fight. I'm here to fight, right. and I'm going to continue to fight until justice for me and my family and my fellow tenants and everybody in the Clay Arsenal Renaissance Apartment, everybody in Connecticut has justice or justice is served. Yeah. Thank you very much. I must say Joshua Serrano is probably one of the most, uh, it's a pleasure to work with him, his energy and what he brings to uh, this organizing effort. Uh, I would like to bring up uh, a young lady who uh, is a fighter, who has children, and who is a mother, Miss Milagros Ortiz. Can we please put our hands together for her, please? Good evening. My name is Milagros Ortiz. I'm a team leader. I reside at 1545 Main Street, apartment C1. And I got involved in this campaign because of my apartment was infested with mice and my daughter was afraid to sleep at night. Due to the public action led by tennis leaders as me in the summer, Ku started to do more to treat the rodent infestation. However, not a single window in my apartment fits the frame. They are all loose. Maintenance install plastic tabs to keep the windows from falling in on us. But it would take very little strength to push the window in. I live on the first floor, and I fear for my safety and my children's safety, and we are not the only family afraid. Because the windows do not fit, cold air flows through my apartment in the winter month, making it uncomfortable or expensive to heat. The ongoing health and safety issues my family and other tenants live with is the reason why I'm here tonight. I am sorry I have moved into Ku's property, and I really hope the city will do what it needs to make this right. Thank you. Thank you, Malagros. And will her children just wave her hand, wave their hands real quick, please? Wave them high, man. Put them high. Let's go. Uh, next and finally, we will have I call her the mother of the movement. This lady cannot go anywhere in the city of Hartford without getting stopped. I remember walking with her, and it took us 15 minutes to get one location. Because, Mama Terry, how you doing? <laughs> she was an educator at Weaver and one of the most prominent leaders in this movement. Can we please put our hands together for Miss Terry Morrison? Thank you, AJ. Thank you, Christian Activity Council. And thank you, everyone who is in attendance tonight. First and foremost, I would like to say I am a voter. I am a city resident, I pay taxes, and I deserve to live in a beautiful environment. I wash my dishes every day, I wash my butt every day, I wash my kids every day. You know, I keep it real. As a parent, I felt like I felt my kids when I moved into this property because I initially tried to make contact with my office managers and they had changed within 10 days of me moving in the property. I moved in the property with 13 incidents um, or a fiction, a fact, a affected situations. They asked me to write them down, and when I went to report them, there was nobody to rectify those situations. After living there for about eight months, I started seeing mice 
the mice became so bad that there were mice on my stove while I'm cooking. Jesus. While the stove is hot on the left side, a mouse is peeking up out of the eye on the right side. I automatically developed a good relationship with my exterminator. He worked with Ehrlich, and he said, your property manager is only playing for glue boards. Mm. He's not paying for poison. He's not paying for coughing. He's paying for glue boards. That's right. We do what we're paid to do. Right. He's taking the cheapest way out because all he has to do is prove to the city that he's addressing the problem. Right. Not making it better, just addressing the problem. So now, as a parent, the first thing I had to do was train my kids not to be so afraid. But if I'm afraid of mice, because we have, I, I wasn't raised in that environment, so how can I properly nurture my children in that environment, as well as my grandchildren? So some of the situations that they took initially was they started cocking underneath my heaters with a lot of different colors of foam and noticing that the mice were eating through that and it wasn't working, then we automatically took action because they were blocking holes but not killing mice. So it came fast forward to where I am now with my, my heaters. I can't turn on my heat because today when my HUD inspector came, he said it's redundant because all of that is supposed to be sucking in air. And the caulking or the, the method, the cheap method that they were using is not good for the health of my kids if I turn on the heat. So all of that has to be removed. We use space heaters right now, but we're not desperate. We are not cold. And we don't have mice anymore. That's the best victory of the whole situation. My kids used to go to school and sleep, and my kids are on the honor roll. They would sleep in school and tell their teacher they had to sleep there because mice were running through the walls and they could hear them. But not only could they hear them, they could see them. And my neighbors have had mice in their kids' beds. And I think that when it's to the point where the mice are in your crib and you can't do anything if you're sleeping, you think your baby's in his crib sleep and it's so high off the floor, what do you do as a parent? You automatically take action to protect your kids and your family. Okay, so this is why we are here, and it definitely has made a difference in our building because my kids sleep better now, and they can walk on the floor at night without being terrified, and now me as a parent, I can sleep more through the night because I don't have to worry about the mice. Right. But if you look over here, that was Thanksgiving. I have two bathrooms, and both of them were overflowing with human feces from the toilets and the bathtubs for Thanksgiving. At 7.52 in the morning was the first gurgle. And then the second time it happened was about 8.30 at night. Well, the maintenance office number was um, off because the office was going to be closed until Monday. The outgoing message said that they would call me during regular business hours, and we had already been informed that the office was going to be closed on Friday. I called the city, and I had heat, so that wasn't considered an emergency. Mm -hmm. Right. So I also had the number of some of the maintenance workers that were performing work in my apartment. So I called one of them, and he came over, and he let me know he wasn't getting paid for this because he was on salary, but that he understood the urgency and the type of person I was. So he came, and he helped me. He helped me at 7.52 in the morning, and he helped me at 8.30 at night. At 8.30 at night, he didn't leave until 1 o'clock Friday morning. I had to clean my bathrooms at least two or three times on Thanksgiving from the top to the bottom. The shower curtains had to be removed. The rugs had to be discarded. And then I thought it was over. And then Sunday, after Thanksgiving, it happened again. So my stomach turned upside down. I couldn't eat Thanksgiving dinner. I had to pack it into go trays and send my family away. I just thought it was egregious because after all of that, then it happened again the following Sunday. And then when I called the office on Monday and spoke about the problem, nobody came back to me regarding it because they said, did it happen again? And I'm like, no, but what if it happens again? You know, I need to make sure that they didn't do a patchwork, a quick fix. They didn't put a Band-Aid on a stitch because I live on the first floor. And that's a health issue. And if they didn't clean it, it's affecting us. Because how you want to walk through a hallway, even in the main, in the main common area, they, they came from the basement with their plumbing supplies and they left a stench. And I told them that if they didn't clean it, that it was going to be a serious problem because we have to walk past there. And they cleaned it. But my whole thing is my landlord needs to take responsibility and make sure that I can live as good as him. That's right. That's right. My kids are going to college, and they're going to be great people, and they don't deserve to have these horror stories because I'm a good mom, and I get it done. You see what I'm saying? So don't give up, and anybody that's scared to talk, open your mouth because it'll work. Thank you, Miss Terry. Thank you for everything that you do. If you're standing by the door, please come in. We, we don't want to create a fire hazard tonight. If you can come in, there are some seats up here in the front. What you heard tonight are compelling stories. And I am proud of the selfless organizing 
and incredible risk these tenants have taken to improve conditions for everyone. Can we please give them all a hand? Over the last seven months, we've been working with Mayor Brown and staff to identify ways to address slumlords in the city of Hartford. The residents, after a lot of research and conversation with the mayor himself and his staff, have developed specific ask of the mayor to help rectify the situation. Josh. Thank you, AJ. Mr. Bronin, Mayor Bronin, at this time we would like to ask you to come forward. Momentary, yes. Thank you, you boss. Stay right there. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Appreciate you. <laughs> Thank you for taking the time to research this issue and for being here with us tonight. We really appreciate you. No problem. So, really quick. We have three questions to ask you, Mr. Bronin, and we kindly ask you that you give us a simple yes or no answer, and at the end of the questions, we will give you five minutes to respond. But we do ask that you give us just a yes or no at this time. Thank you. I'll try if I can. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, if you'll step up to the podium. The city currently has a housing law that requires landlords to have a certificate of apartment occupancy on file for all of their units. The fine for not doing this is $99 per day per unit. To get a certificate of occupancy, the unit has to be inspected, which is an added layer of protection for the tenants. To date, we understand from your staff that Mr. Ku only has three certificates of occupancy on file. We realize enforcing the CAO can be prohibitive, but at this time, when other enforcement measures are lacking, it is a concrete uh, look, we can, tool we can use with slumlords in Hartford to help improve conditions faster. We know that the Office of License and Inspection, shout out to Deline Robinson Childs and Kiana that's here tonight, is short staffed given the city's well-documented fiscal challenges. However, we also know that enforcing a certificate of, uh, certificate of occupancy is one very concrete thing the city can do to help improve living conditions to hold Mr. Ku and other landlords accountable. Mayor Bronin, the tenants of Kara Apartments are asking you to begin enforcing the certificate uh, uh, apartment occupancy ordinance on landlords receiving tax abatements effective immediately. Will you do this, yes or no? We have already sent notices to Mr. Koo. Yes. So yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Let me say, wait. Can no, you'll, you'll, have, you'll, you'll have okay, five minutes the at the end to, <laughs> to say what you need to say, All sir. Right. All right. Fall on back. Fall back. <laughs> <laughs> Number two. Mr. Mayor, Emmanuel Koo enjoys a large tax abatement in the city a city that is struggling financially when it comes to education, libraries, and other things in our community. In exchange for this tax abatement, which this year will total 266 in taxes that, does, that he does not have to pay the city, he is expected to make significant improvements to the conditions of the apartments with the money he saves in taxes. Mr. Mayor, you are aware that we have worked with city council Thank you to Councilwoman Gwendolyn Thames for introducing a resolution this past Monday. Can we give her a hand? <laughs> Passing a resolution requiring the abatement committee to review the tax abatement uh, to evaluate Mr. Ku's compliance. Here is the question. Will you, Mr. Mayor, commit to meeting with the tenants in 30 days to discuss the results of the abatement from the com uh, abatement committee review? Yeah. Yes or no? Yeah. Thirty days. Don't let your schedule fill up now. <laughs> Question number three: Will you, Mr. Mayor, support pulling Mr. Ku's abatement if the committee yes. finds him to be out of compliance? Yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> 
Final question for you, sir. Mr. Mayor, the abatement contract is weak. Very, very weak. If coup is found to be in compliance, will you commit to a public accounting of how that that's the case? Yes or no? I'm not sure I understand the question, but I think it's yes. <laughs> but I can, I, I can restate it. Later on if you want. I yeah. can restate it sure. for you just so you're yes. clear. Yes. yes. If the, okay. We know that the abatement contract is very weak, right. the, the legal language of right. it. Right. Okay? If coup is found in compliance, yeah. if the committee comes back and says he is good to go, yeah. will you commit to a public accounting of how this is the case? How did by, this happen? By accounting, you mean a discussion about how it was that that language was in there? Correct. Yes, absolutely. Please put your hands together for Mr. Bronin. <laughs> so. Mr. Bronin, you have exactly five minutes to uh, uh, explain right. everything that you have done tonight. And said right. tonight. You give me the hook when I'm done, AJ. Uh, Pastor, Pastor AJ uh, and Corey and Christian Activities Council, thank you. But most importantly, I just wanted to say uh, thank you uh, to Joshua and Miss Jones uh, and Julissa and Milagros uh, and Alicia uh, and Miss Terry uh, for, for sharing your stories tonight. Uh, this, is, this is not the first time that I've heard your stories, but it doesn't get any easier to see or to hear what you've been living with. Uh, and I want to say that I'm sorry you're facing that and living with it and dealing with it, but I am uh, incredibly full of admiration for you, uh, for the way you've raised your voices. Um, and uh, Alicia, I know you're proud of your mom, but I bet she's enormously proud of you. So um, what I want to do since I have limited time. I just want to talk a little bit about some of those questions and then just give a little bit of, of background. So on the, the first question was, will we enforce the certificate of apartment occupancy? So let me give you just a quick background on this. This is something that's been on the books for, for many, many years, decades. I, as far as I know, the city has never really enforced it, partly because it's just not, it doesn't really make sense as it's drafted. What it does is it says that every time an apartment turns over in the city, meaning every time a new tenant rents an apartment, that landlord has to get a certificate of apartment occupancy. It's really, really hard to enforce because we don't know when apartments are being turned over. There's also a very, very large number of them. So uh, that's why from long before I got here, the city had not been enforcing that. What we've done, and this was actually mentioned earlier, but what we've done over the past couple of months, uh, our housing team, is look at other models that would be more effective. And one of the things that we've found, and this is something that New Haven does, is create a renter's licensing program where every landlord has to get a license to rent their properties. And then you're not just trying to get them one at a time when they pop up and do a certificate of apartment occupancy, but you're actually reviewing that landlord's whole record and you're giving them a license. And we are we're preparing language that we will be proposing to the city council to do that. We think that that will be more effective in dealing with situations like this. Your question of will we enforce a certificate of occup uh, apartment occupancy with respect to Coop, Mr. Koo, we have already sent uh, a notice, right, Yali, we have already sent a notice that notifies him that since he became an owner, uh, as at our count, uh, I think 64 apartments have turned over. So we have already sent a notice that he is out of compliance by not seeking that certificate of apartment occupancy, and we will be following up with that, and if he does not come into compliance, we will, we will sue. Now, here's the one thing I wanted to, you gave me one word answer, so it's a little, the, the one thing I want to say, you said, will I do that, will we do that with respect to every pop property that has a tax abatement? Correct. I cannot commit to do that tonight because I don't know how many units that is, and I don't know that our team can handle that. But what we will do is prioritize those inspections based on the records of the landlords, and this one has a deplorable record, uh, and there is no question that uh, we need to use every enforcement tool we have in our toolbox. So yes, with respect to coup, we will look more broadly. I can't commit to doing it on every one because we just don't have the resources. We'll prioritize, and we want to work with you to prioritize that. Um, we will also be doing inspections, uh, a greater number of inspections. Uh, we're not able to do all the inspections we'd want to do. We're going to do a lot more inspections of Mr. Koo's property, the, one, the properties that you are living in, uh, than we do across the city. But here's my ask of you, two things. One, 
help us identify those units that are most urgently in need of inspection so that we can prioritize those. And the second thing is, I know you, you guys have been uh, working incredibly hard to identify these problems and bring them to attention. But my other ask of you is, please notify us of every violation. Because in the last three months, we've only actually gotten six complaints uh, of, uh, of possible violations to our housing department. So it helps us. If, and I know it's burdensome because you're facing dozens of, dozens of potential complaints all the time, but it helps us build that record. So please don't hesitate. Call 311. Get it on the record so that we can follow up. Okay, that was, the, that was one. Um, second one was the abatement uh, review. I'm going to take these ones out of order. The, as you showed earlier, this abatement was granted before I came into office. This was, abatement was granted back in 2014. Uh, and the contract that was used gives very little yes, tools to actually pull it. it. You know, what they ought to say is uh, that if the conditions are not adequate, uh, that you can pull it. If you have an X number of complaints, that you can pull it. In this case, all it says is that if the landlord isn't putting in the same amount of the abatement into the property, either in the form of reduced rent or in the form of improvements, then you can pull it. We've looked back, and in the past, he has been able to show it. Obviously, that's not nearly enough, because when you're talking about 150 units over 26 properties, $226,000 may not actually go that far in terms of making the improvements and reducing the rent. So we, will, we have actually already started the process of reviewing it. We will review it, and to answer the other question, yes, we will absolutely meet with you and review those uh, findings with you. But as you know, because um, we've talked about this uh, all of us together, that contract is not nearly strong enough, but we will use every hook we have in it to try to get a, a, the ability to pull that abatement. Uh, we would love to pull that abatement. We would also love for these fines to start racking up on Mr. Koo, uh, because I'm looking around this room and I see some, I see some people who are responsible. Mr. Mayor, just one second. Uh, to the tenants in the room, do we want to give Mr. Bronin two more minutes to finish? <laughs> Thank you so much. Our business is done correctly. I appreciate it. Thanks. Um, I'm looking around and I see, I see some uh, property owners uh, who, who are local and who do a great job. And I think all of us would like nothing more than to get a responsible landlord owning these properties who actually cares about the community and is focusing on serving the community. So we will use every tool that we have. Um, I think that's all of the, I think that addresses all of the uh, the commitments and the questions there. Uh, I hope our record is is clear that we will we we will meet any time. I mean, I was I, I appreciate the chance to meet with you um, a couple of weeks ago, and we'll meet any time to talk about this and to follow up. Our tools are are more limited than I wish they were. We're going to work to get better tools in place on the books, but using what we've got, we'll do all that we can. And, uh, and I do want to just, uh, Pastor uh, Johnson, you, you already called out uh, Darlene and our housing team, but I want to say thank you to our inspectors, right. to, our, uh, to our housing department, uh, to Councilwoman Thames and the City Council. Um, but again, and I also want to say thank you to Union Baptist for hosting this tonight, and Pastor Buford, so wherever you are, Pastor, thank you. But um, most importantly, uh, I, we really do appreciate and I really do admire you for raising your voices and a testament to CAC uh, that this has been as organized and as effective as it is, and we'll partner with every tool we've got. Okay. Can we please put our hands together for Mayor Bronin? What Mayor Bronin didn't share is that he issued um, a really significant letter this afternoon to the tenants outlining the things the city is going to do uh, to begin enforcing things on Mr. Koo. Um, and there's some important things that he left out, like um, making him have a heating certificate on file for every apartment, and there's a fine that comes for not doing that, um, and tripling the number of inspections they will do in the annual review of his abatement. Uh, it should be 10%, and they're going to do 30%. And so we just wanted to thank uh, the mayor and Kylie for their work on extending even what we had requested of them. As we come to an end, for those of you who have not been in the weeds and in the struggle with us on this issue for the past seven months, 
we need you to know how important the winds are tonight. Tonight, you have seen and witnessed what organized power can accomplish. Can you put your hands together for that, please? <laughs> Seven months ago, tenants as individuals could not get a meeting with key leaders. Today, they are at the negotiating table with them. Seven months ago, HUD was unaware of Mr. Koo's apartment conditions in Hartford. Now he is in enforcement division and has the attention of, con of a congressional investigation. Seven months ago, it was acceptable for Mr. Koo to not have heating inspections on file or certificate of apartment occupancies on file. Tonight, he, tonight he's being forced to comply or he will be fined. I feel like preaching. Seven months ago, tenants were desperate in their living conditions, and tonight they have support of the whole community working for living conditions that they deserve. Shout out to you, the community, the many people who have showed up tonight, the Greater Hartford Sponsoring Committee, to all the friends and family that are here tonight. However, as we end this, the uncomfortable reality is that tonight, many of our brothers and sisters will return home to substandard apartments. Despite all of these wins, the fight continues. And I would ask all of you who are willing to stand with the tenants yes, until they are no longer under Ku's control Please rise and show solidarity for each and every unit, each and every apartment, each and every family. And tonight, I want us to end with these words of Sister Asada Shakur. I want you to repeat after me. It is our duty to fight for freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love each other and support each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. Say it again. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. Say it with your chest. It is our duty to win. We must love each other and support each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. Go in peace. My name is Jay Stan McCauley, and uh, I do business as Light Source Productions. I provide professional services in the area of strategic video communications. Uh, first, what we do is we help you craft your message uh, using what I call the rule of the five W's, who, what, when, where, and why. We do event documentation, uh, content acquisition, full-scale productions, um, editing, and, of course, distribution uh, through our social media television network. And with social media, uh, video is more important now than it has ever been. Uh, whether you're talking big business, small business, nonprofit, church, or just an individual. Uh, let's say you, you know you you plan uh, uh, you're planning an event, a wedding, whatever the case may be. But but let's say a big event, uh, but no video. And you spend all this time, all these hours, uh, to put this event on, and maybe a hundred, two hundred people attend the event. But more important than that is that thousands could attend by watching it on social media. But of course, you don't think about this until after the event is over. You can't afford not to capture it for social media. And despite what people think, I am affordable. Give me a call. Let's plan your next video project and share it with the world on my social media television network. 
I promise you that you will have the attention of one person. Me.